I'm Tanya Fox, and you're listening to Fox Talks Business Podcast. I started my career in the corporate world, but always played to my own tune and love to think outside of the box. This didn't always serve me well with the bosses, so I made the decision to become an entrepreneur. And that little seed of entrepreneurial curiosity continued to grow as I branched out into retail, service, and franchise businesses. Now, I have been fortunate to have amazing successes in the last two decades, but they did not come without some really big failures and even bigger lessons learned. And that's why I started this podcast, not just to share the failures, but to show you how you can turn every failure into a success. We're going to hear from some amazing humans from around the world that are going to share their stories of the good, the bad, and the motivational entrepreneurial life has to offer. After all, life is too short to make all of the mistakes yourself. So why not learn from each other? And of course, we're going to have some fun because as I always say, well, you know what? I'll tell you that at the end of the episode. Foxy listeners, I am excited for my guest today, Nikki. Nikki, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to spend this time with you. So I've been listening to your, you know, podcast. I I had heard about it a bit ago and I've really been binging it to make sure that I catch up because I'm bad with everybody's podcast. Um, (laughs) So take no offense to that. But for those that haven't been sort of diving um, into your world, tell them a little bit about, um, you know, who you are and what it is that you do. Thank you so much. So I'm a sales coach. I'm the founder of Sales Maven. And that is an organization where I teach people how to have more strategic and frankly, easier sales conversations. And I do that through my signature framework, which is known as the selling staircase. It's a five-step process to a sales conversation. And I work with clients, um, you know, privately and one-on-one I do team trainings. Uh, I do, I have a group coaching program. And then of course I have the podcast. I've authored three books and really I, it's my whole kind of why behind my business is to show women how you can have strategic sales conversations, make them easy, close more business, and ultimately make a bigger impact in your business, your life, your family, and your community. Well, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show, because so often I talk to people and the very last thing that they ever want to do, or sometimes even thought they would have to do in business, um, is, is to do sales because, you know, they think of like that Tupperware lady or that used car salesman, or just like, it's, it's a, (laughs) the idea of it feels kind of icky and dis, Mm -hmm. you know, not genuine or it feels like really forced. So can you talk to us a little bit about how people can start to create a more, positive first impression, because that's kind of, you know, we're so online these days that it's, it's for me uh, to use as an example, face to face with somebody, I can make a really great impression because I don't think of it. I just kind of talk and it's natural. So what are some of the things that could help us sort of create that good first impression, but also to sort of establish an actual real connection? Because I think that's people are feeling lost there. Yeah. It kind of goes back to, I think the difference in sales philosophy is that a lot of people have been on the receiving end of people who are selling at them. And when you're selling at people, you're word vomiting, you're, you're talking at them. And we do this a lot on social media. We get talked at and we talk at others. And what I teach around sales is that you have to have with conversations, that sales actually is a collaborative experience. It's not something you do to somebody. It's something you do with. And so specifically to your question about online, one of the easiest ways to learn how to talk with people is to ask questions. And we make a lot of statements online. We show up in people's inboxes or their DMs and we tell them all the reasons why our company is great or why our product will help them. That's talking at people. And if you want to talk with, start asking a question. Instead of saying like, our products will help you do X, Y, and Z, ask them, would you benefit from having a product that does X, Y, and Z? That's how you talk with people. You ask them questions. I love this because I think, you know, we've all had those things, you know, LinkedIn, I find is really bad for this where people will say, Hey, I'm really interested in connecting like, you know, uh, and then it's like, 
you know, let me raise your, you know, how many followers you have by 10,000 or I've got yeah. this product for you. And I'm like, you didn't even ask me if I needed that. <laughs> or if they even have permission to like launch into their pitch with you, you know, it, it, you should have somebody's permission before you start selling them. If you don't have their permission, that. chances are you're going to alienate them or you're going to offend them. Like we're so savvy nowadays. Like we know there's a million choices out there for whatever, it doesn't matter what product or service you're selling. It doesn't matter how unique you tell everybody you are. There is somebody else out there or there's another way to get the outcome that somebody might need without working with you. So you need to differentiate yourself. And one of the ways to differentiate yourself is to start asking questions. Be be interested in the people in the businesses that you want to work with instead of telling them what you know about them or telling them what a big deal you are. Like, frankly, we're kind of all sick of it. I know I am. So what are some of the questions, you know, cause some people might be like, I don't like, what is the right question to ask? So when you say, you know, to like ask a question, can you give us like, and I know that it, there's so many variables to this, but could you just give us some questions that people could sort of mull over or change into their, you know, own industry? Yeah. So, so one is like, um, you could ask how important is X, Y, and Z to you? Or you could say, is this something that you'll be focusing on this year? You know, insert whatever context there. Um, have you considered X, Y, and Z? Like any of these are questions that I guarantee you will separate you from 90% of all the other messages out there that people are getting because you know, one of, one of the things I work with my clients a lot on is I rewrite a lot of their, their messages. So I have a group coaching program. They go in there and they post their message for me and then I rewrite them. And one of the things I point out to people all the time is, you know, you just sent an, like an example of a 15 sentence email. There's not one question in there. You know, all you're mm -hmm. doing is making statements. And so here's, here's the most basic and, and sometimes people push back on this with me, but it's true. There's a difference between saying to somebody, I hope you're having a great day and how is your day going? One's a question and one's a statement. One's talking at and one's talking with. Saying, I hope you're having a great day doesn't elicit any conversation back from the other right. person. It's just like, good luck. <laughs> yeah, it's like, good luck with you your know, day. Have a, nice, have a nice life. Good <laughs> luck to you. Well, that doesn't engage anybody. But if you say, how's your day going? The person may or may not answer it. But I'll tell you what, you are more likely to get an answer to how's your day going versus I hope you're having a great day. That's not saying like, tell me, how's your day going? That's just talking at somebody. And that's the most simplified example. And I can, you know, I go through this with clients all the time of showing them of like, you know, this, what you're saying right here is a statement. And instead, let's turn it into a question. Like, I'd like to earn your business is a statement. Is there an opportunity for me to earn your business is a question. And questions are things that people can answer. Right. Which then, you know, initiates an actual conversation mm -hmm. with them mm -hmm. and then allows you to, you know, almost learn more about what it is that they actually may need. Yeah. I mean, again, just to differentiate yourself from everybody else out there, nobody else is asking them questions. So when you start asking somebody a question and if they're willing to answer the question and you're willing to engage in that way with them, you already are showing them like, I'm going to treat you like you're a real person. You're not just a wallet that I'm trying to get money out of. You're a real person. I'm going to treat you as such. And I'm a real person too. We can have a back and forth conversation, even if it's over, you know, DM or email or LinkedIn or any of the platforms that you want to talk about. This is where like real connections happen. I mean, imagine going out to like lunch, somebody, somebody sets up a lunch date for you and they're like, you know, Tanya, go out, have lunch with this person. They're so amazing. I think you guys would really like each other. And you sit down and they're like, okay, let me tell you all about me <laughs> and how amazing I am. And then I'm going to tell you all about my business and how long I've been doing it. And then I'm going to tell you all about your business and why you should hire me. Would you be like, do I need to be here for this lunch? <laughs> 
Like, how is this benefiting me? You don't. You go out to Can lunch. You just record people, this and, and have... email it to me later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you have conversation, right? You go back mm. and forth. Like, like, tell me a little bit about your business. And now the person will say, Well, tell me about your business or tell me about your family life. Or like, and then you have real conversations. There's no reason to act like any other form of communication is different and that you should talk to people differently just because you're sending them an email. I love this because I think that, you know, it, what it also does is, is take that, um, you know, that worry out of, you know, am I going to sound like I'm, you know, that, that pesky salesperson where people are like, oh my God, I just walked in the door. <laughs> I don't need your help yet. I don't even know what you do. Like just, you know, kind of calm down. But I think it also too, you know, would cut down on, you know, the negative answers. Cause sometimes I, I will freely admit, I don't answer too nicely when somebody connects and then sells me right away. Like I'm like, you know, that old cracking of the knuckles happens and I'm like, all right, listen, <laughs> let me riddle to you what you did wrong. That's right. <laughs> you know? That's right. That's because, right. you know, and I've said this before and tell me what, you know, you kind of think is because I always think if I'm having a conversation with somebody or even if they're, you know, we're doing that back and forth, maybe I don't need to use them. But if I feel like they're genuine, maybe I know somebody that I could be like, hey, this person, you know, needs you. Can, can I pass you off? But if it's like that right off the gate sales call, you'll never get the referral out of me because I'm like, uh, I feel like this is what you're going to be through the whole relationship. Yeah. And you don't want to sick, sick, those type of people on the people that you like, right? Like you don't right. want to send your friend with somebody who's like, Hey, this person's going to treat you like you're just a listening device for them. And they're just going to talk into you and you're supposed to just absorb it. They're going to be like, thanks a lot. How about don't ever send me anybody yeah. again, right? Buckle up, Becky. I'm sending you this guy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So the thing about that is when, when you, you know, I actually have had many people who have never hired me or work with me, refer me to people mm -hmm. who then do hire me. Cause they're like, well, this person, you know, they, they're no longer, you know, they no longer are an entrepreneur. So they're not looking for help on sales, but they say you're the person to go, to go to when they found out I was starting my business. Right. Like that's really common. And yeah. those are like, that to me is the highest compliment. Somebody who hasn't actually ever even worked with me, that's still out there being an ambassador for, for my work. And we want that. We, you should all want that for your business. Well, and I think, you know, I have one lady who's like that, that and it's so funny when anybody comes in, cause they'll like, she's like, she says she's too soft, but she thinks I need somebody like you. Um, I remember having that conversation and being like, okay, can you explain this to me? And she was like, I just like, I really need to be like handheld and like told I'm pretty and like, I'm doing a good job. Like I need those affirmations. And I just, I know you're not that person, but I know this person totally needs that. And I was like, okay. Cause it just sounds weird when it comes to, like, do I need to be a little bit more soft? You know, it's kind of, <laughs> and, you know, well, it's my bark too that. hard. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I will say I have a pretty soft approach to sales, which I think my clients really like, but I, I had a client at one point, she used to describe me as the velvet hammer. She's like, I think he's going to give it to you. You're going to think it's really soft, but it's, she's going to be direct. So I, I try to follow the philosophy. Actually, I don't try to, this is my philosophy is I'm not here to be nice. I'm here to be kind and I will always be kind. And if you're paying me money, I'm going to tell you the things that you need to hear that are going to make a difference in your business. I'm not going to be attached to you doing my way or your way. I'm just going to give you all I can possibly give the most value possible. And then you get to decide with, what to do with it. I'll never be the person who's like, well, too bad on you. You didn't follow my advice. I'll just be like, I'm sorry, that didn't work out for you. If you decide to go in a different direction, right? Like I think being kind is different than being nice. Oh, well, I agree with you. And I, I, I had to write that down because I was like, that, that sounds better than, than anything that, that I usually say, but it's true. You, you want a coach who's not going to be nice. You want them to be able to, like you said, tell it as it is anybody that you're you're working with or you're paying you you want them to be honest with you yeah. maybe not maybe without the brutal <laughs> yeah <laughs> or or in that kind way i'm i'm going to tell yes. you exactly what you need to hear 
Um, Mm -hmm. but I'll be kind about it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And speak, you know, my two like ultimate, when people ask me like, what are the two things that are the most important to you as far as showing up in your business? And my two words are always kind and credible. Like, I'm not going to tell you things that I don't do myself. I'm not going to ask you to do things that I wouldn't do. And I'm not attached to you doing things my way. And I'll support you every step of the way. And I'll be kind doing it. And I am going to give direction, right? There there will be direction. There will, I'm, I'm here to guide. I'm not here to follow. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about cat versus dog. Okay. So let's give a little bit of context because, okay. you know, we're talking about cat calling and dog calling. There's yeah. a technique to that and one is better than the other. So give us a little bit, of, give everybody else a little bit of context around that. <laughs> and then what, what are these cat calling and dog calling techniques? Yeah. Okay. So the, where this comes from is I mentioned earlier, this five-step process to a sales conversation that I have. So step one is making a powerful first impression. And we kind of already talked about like learn how to ask questions and have a real conversation. Step two is creating curiosity. This is the most missed step. Most people, when I ask them, do you know how to create curiosity when you're talking about your business or your services, your product, they look at me and they're like, what, what do you mean curiosity? <laughs> like that's usually a no, right? Like, so <laughs> The, I always explain curiosity as it's the difference between how you call a dog and how you call a cat. So if you think about if you're, I don't know, are you a dog or cat lover? I don't know this about you. I have dogs. Okay. Um, so I, I don't dislike cats, okay. but I have, I have allergies in the house that don't allow me to, to have them, but there's no judgment the either way. <laughs> There's no judgment about it. It's just like, if you think about if you're going to call your dogs, a lot of times we change our voice, we change our demeanor and we show up with this, what I call dog calling energy, which is like, come here, boy, come here. Like, like it's a little high pitch. It's like, oh my gosh, we're going to yeah. do something fun. And unfortunately, when we show up and in a sales conversation and we're like, oh my gosh, I could totally help this person. And we show up with dog calling energy. We tend to word vomit. We tend to come off a little too strong and people push away from that. They go like, oh, too much. I don't like the dog calling energy. So on the flip side of that, if you think about, if you want to get a cat's attention, you can't call it like you call a dog. You know, you can't say, come here, cat, come here, cat, come here. Cat. The cat <laughs> is going like, to run from you. No. Like <laughs> I'm out. But instead, if you do this thing where you're like, here, kitty, kitty, here, kitty, kitty. Now cats don't even always even come to that. But sometimes they'll give you a look. They'll give you just enough of their attention to go, what? Yeah. Like, what are you doing? I'll check you you out a little. Treat? Is that a treat? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like, is it something that I'm interested in? Or you think you're going to, like, clip my nails and I'm going to run from that, right? (laughs) So when you show up in conversations, one of the easiest ways to create curiosity is to think, can you create what, what I call a hair kitty kitty response to a question? So we want to give people enough information for them to want to know more without it being like tricky or confusing or word vomiting, right? Like there's, you have to find a balance here. So I usually say your answer to some standard questions, this is a way to kind of build your curiosity creating muscle is think about how you would answer really basic questions. Like for instance, if somebody said, how are you? Now you could say, fine, how are you? That doesn't create any curiosity. You could say, you could say, well, let me tell you about the last five days. So when I woke up, you know, last Wednesday, this is what happened. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I asked how long is this story going to go on for? That's dog calling energy. That's that like word vomit. So we need something in between. You want to say something that allows the other person to have a potential follow-up question. So think about what you want to talk about right now in your business and what could you say? So for instance, if somebody said, Nikki, how are you? I might say, oh, I'm great. I spent all day yesterday recording my next masterclass. That was about two sentences. Now that may pique somebody's curiosity. It may have them go, what was the, what's the class for? What does that mean? What do you mean recording? Like, you know, and then that, right. now I can talk about the masterclass if that's something I want to talk about. Or if you've got something going on in your business and somebody goes like, what's new with you? You could say, oh, I'm working on something I haven't even announced to my clients yet. Right. What's going to be the follow-up question yeah. to that? They're going to be like, what Tell is me. it? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, 
so it's just enough information to start a conversation. And then when you're able to create curiosity, these, these here, kitty, kitty responses, people will start asking questions, which oftentimes lead to buying signals. If you're talking to a prospective client. So if you said like, Oh, I've got this new thing going on. I haven't even announced it to my clients and they go, what is it? And you start telling them about it. And they're like, Oh my gosh, I think I need that. Well, that's a buying signal right there. When you get a buying signal, now you can invite them to the next step. So maybe the next step is to have a conversation to see if they're a good fit for your next program. Maybe the conversation is, you know, well, if you'd like to go ahead and place your order, I'm happy to take that, right? Like it depends on what the logical next step is, but that's how you move people through the conversation is you create some curiosity. It's super crucial to the success of your business for not only you to be able to do it, but for your team members to do it too. I know we were talking mm -hmm. before we started the recording that you have some listeners that have a team of people. And I would suspect that their team of people, some of them are interfacing with perspective or with, with your existing clients, right? Yeah. They're maybe doing the deliverables depending on what type of business they're in. And you want to teach your team how to plant seeds and create curiosity because the easiest business to earn is repeat business. And if your team doesn't know how to create a little curiosity with your existing clients, you never assume that your existing clients know additional ways to work with you or what else you could provide to them. That's your team's job to plant those seeds. And that means you have to train your team on how to create curiosity. Well, and I think this is so key because we never think of sort of having that conver, you know, that conversation. And I remember when I, uh, you know, had an accounting company, my secretary was the best, like she mm. would get the dirt and she was just a talker. So nobody ever sat on hold. If she could help it, she would just talk to them. And, but she got so much information that I wasn't utilizing for the longest time, but she would be like, oh, did you know that Jim just bought a new boat? Like she would have the whole like story of what was going on in his life and what was happening. Like, I was just like this, like at first I was like, are you just really nosy? But in listening to her, I realized that for her, it was just, she was doing that curiosity piece where she just mm -hmm. really was honestly curious about what was going on in that other person's life. And she used to always say, like, she always asks, how are you twice? Because she goes, the first time is always fine. Um, she goes, but usually when you ask again, no, really, how are you? She's like, all of a sudden, it's like you gave them permission to tell you, you know, what they're really thinking or what's actually on your mind. And, and, and she's like, and I just really hate hold music. Our hold music sucks. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's perfect. That's an example. That's exa that's the perfect example of what I was talking about of like mm -hmm. asking people questions. Now, you know, she, you know, she learned that sometimes you have to ask them twice for to go below, below the surface answer. Mm -hmm. And she was willing to do that. Like how invaluable of a team member is that that's willing to do that and ask yourself for anybody listening, are you willing to do that? And do you ever do that? with people, because if you're not doing that, chances are you're spending a lot of time talking at people and no offense, but there's a lot of people out there that are sick of you talking at them. Mm -hmm. They're just sick of it. Well, and I think your current clients too, right? Like sometimes mm -hmm. we come up with all this, you know, new stuff or these new techniques, but we forget then to go back to the people we already have and, and kind of, you know, go, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> like, yeah, what's up with you? <laughs> Yeah. Like what, what is up with you and, and what's new in your business and how can I be a resource to you right now? Like if you haven't asked your, your existing clients or your former clients, how like that question there, I, chances are you've left some money on the table mm -hmm. because sometimes people don't even know that they should be even asking you a question or that it's even appropriate. But if you ask somebody like, how can I be a resource to you? Now you might get a crazy answer of like, uh, I need somebody to paint my house. And they're, and you're thinking, well, I don't know how I can do that. But if I come across a painter, I'll, you know, send them your way. Or they could go, you know, I'm really in need of some support around this. Is that something you do? And then you can be like, yeah, that is something I do. Should we talk about what that would look like for us to work together in a retainer package or whatever that is that you offer? Well, and I think sometimes what happens too is, you know, as we're talking about sort of our services and stuff, I think sometimes what, you know, what I hear happens and what even I've done myself is 
I offer, um, you know, I don't listen enough to what they want. So I'm like, oh, here, this service. Um, and that's all they hear about. Um, and they don't hear about every, so I'm kind of offering them what I think they need as opposed mm -hmm. to offering. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Some of the downfalls of that, when you are proposing the service to your clients, as opposed to. Yeah, for sure. There, there are times where it might make sense for you to just recommend one offer based on what they've said, but there will be times where you could say to them, you know, there's potentially three ways that we could solve this for you. Now, the reason I love the word, like, I, I like this idea of giving people three options. If you give more than three options, you're overwhelming them. So knock right. it off. And if you only give one option, the answer is either yes or no. So right. when you can have a few options, that's good. And it's good for our brains to be able to go like, no to this one, no to this one, yes to this one. Now, the way you lay out your options is also really critical. You need to lay them out what's known as top-down selling. So you start with the most expensive option first and you work your way down. And there's, an, I can go into as much detail as you want us to Yeah, go that. away. <laughs> okay. So the reason that's important is because as humans, we don't like to have things taken away from us. Like we kind of have this, I, I often give the example of, you know, think about a little baby, firstborn baby. One of the things a baby comes out of the womb knowing, knowing how to already do is grasp. Like, you know, if you've ever had your hair pulled by, by an infant, you know, like, ow, right? But they already know how to grasp. So we we tend to like to hold on to things. That's a, kind of a human nature. And so when you go top down selling, it looks like, well, I have to give something up to save money. But if you start at the bottom and you and you sell from the bottom, you know, the least expensive to the next option to the most expensive now you're essentially saying to somebody, you got to pay more to get more. It's a different mindset. And, and so right. it triggers something differently. So you want to do top-down selling. Now you want to stay in integrity. Like don't recommend something that's not going to solve a problem for somebody or something that's like, if a $10,000 solu $10, solution is the solution, you probably are out of integrity if you're offering them a $100,000 solution, right? Right. So stay in integrity. But if you say, you know, there are three possible ways that we could solve this for you. Um, you know, the top way to do that would be to do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, and here's what that includes. Now, the kind of the step down from there, and this is actually the one I'd probably recommend for you, is this way. Da, 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 you know, explain it. And then the most basic way would be to, you know, the starter would be to do this. And then you say, of those three options, which is the best fit for you right now? And you let them tell you what would make the most sense. So top-down selling is really important. Giving people some options allows for their brain to go, well, I probably don't need the most expensive you know, package. And I probably don't want the least expensive you know, package. I want to get something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so a lot of times you know, clients will often come to me and, and we'll talk about their offers. And, and I'll ask them, well, what do you most want to sell? What do you most enjoy doing? And what do you make the best money on? Like what's best for your business? And then we talk about it and I go, okay, so if this is the package that you want to sell, we need to create a package that sits above it. We need to create an anchor that's a more expensive option that goes above it. And that's really important. Um, and then, and then we talk about, do we need a basic model as well? So I kind of went off the rails there. <laughs> No, that <laughs> I think I that's saying, perfect but... because I think it gives a lot for people to, to, you know, to think about. And it's true. Usually when you're faced with three options, it's like a two, no, and a yes, right? Yes. Like you, you just kind of move this one, move this one, and then you're left with something, right? Whereas right. like you said, if it's just one option, they kind of look at it and go, yeah, um, no, you know, it's, it's a quick decision. I can afford it. I can't, you know, it's, it's, it's very basic, which is why almost everything that's out there has multiple options. That's um, right. for, you know, I just think of like a pop cooler and like, there's just tons of options, usually mostly from the same three companies. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah we like options. Our brains like options. So what is one thing, if you can think about like, you know, that 
because we've already talked about like some things that people need to be paying attention to, making sure that they're asking the questions, you know, we talked about, and I love the cat calling and dog calling because it's so true and it's an easy way to remember it, right? But making sure that you're kind of making them sort of go, oh, tell me more about that. I want to learn more about that, Um, you know, and, and we're giving them their options. But how, you know, can you talk to us a little bit more about some buying signals? Because I think sometimes what happens is that, you know, people sort of, they've, they've got that all set. They know kind of what their pitch or whatever is, but they're, they're missing when people are like, hi, yeah, I'm in the cart, please. <laughs> yeah. So buying signals are signals that people give. They're, they're verbal and nonverbal cues that people give that indicate interest. And I actually wrote my second book about buying signals because they're so prevalent and most people miss them. So just to give you an example of a potential buying signal, I'll, I'll give you a really obvious one and then I'll give you one that might not seem as obvious. So a really obvious buying signal is somebody asks you about pricing. Now, here's where people drop the ball when it comes to this as a buying signal. They either say it depends, which <laughs> is never the answer to the price question, even if there's a part of you right now that's saying to yourself, but Nikki, it does depend. Okay. I know, but that's still not how you answer that question. And then I'll tell you how to answer it in just a second. Or they, they just give the price and leave it there. Right. So it's both of those are a mistake number. because okay. you're not, you're not getting people to the next step. So if somebody says, what's your price for this? I want you to say what the price is and I want you to follow it up with an invitation so let's say somebody asks about one of your packages and you say, well, that particular package is $7,000. And then you say, is that something you would like to get signed up for or whatever makes sense, you know, the, mm -hmm. related to the package. Now, if somebody says, well, what's your pricing and you want to say it depends, stop yourself and then say this. Pricing typically ranges between $5,000 and $10,000. Now, in order to give you a more specific answer, would you be open to allowing me to ask you a couple questions and find out a little bit more about the specifics for you? And then I'll happily offer you some pricing. Oh, I like that. So ask permission. So it's, I'm still moving them to the next step. So if I can't give them pricing off the top of my head, because maybe it does depend on how many people are going to participate or when is it, or do you have to travel for it? Or are you shipping something somewhere? Like whatever's going on in your business you still need to invite them to the next step. And the only way to invite them is to give a real answer. But if you say, it depends, check my website, or most people don't put pricing on their website, although they should, and you, and you just leave it there, then a lot of times people won't like take it further. The, the prospect won't take it further because they're, they're overwhelmed with so many decisions as it is. They have so many other things on their plate calling for their attention. This is just one thing. And if you don't make it easy for people to hire you in the moment and in the conversation, they actually won't. They'll wait until they find somebody else who offers something similar to what you offer. And they'll hire that person if that person makes it easy for them. So your job is to make it really easy for that person to have success in the conversation with you. That means you guide them every step of the way. And the way that you guide people is by issuing invitations every step of the way. And invitations come in the form of a question. Well, I think everybody wants to be invited to things, right? Like, <laughs> I, it, I think that's just like sort of a basic human need. You said something that piqued my interest before, um, and I'm curious for you to expand on it. Uh, so a okay. little rabbit hole here. But when you were talking about having pricing on your website, can you yeah. expand on that a little bit more? I'm really curious about, <laughs> speaking okay. of causing questions, I'm so curious of what your thought is uh, a little bit deeper on, on that subject. Yeah. So here's my philosophy about this is that if people are coming to your website and they're trying to find out a little bit more about what you do, one of the things they're looking for is pricing. And if you don't put it on your website, and I know that this goes against a lot of what sales coaches teach. This is where I differ. Sales coaches and I don't agree on this at all because they think, well, but you really want to get the person on the phone and you want to establish value. And then once you establish value, when you lay out the price for them, there it's an easy yes. Unfortunately, most of the people who are looking and they don't see pricing on your website, they just move on to somebody else. They'll go to some other website and see if they can find pricing because if they can't find it on yours and if that is important to them, 
then it's going to be awkward. You're now putting them in a position to be on the back foot in a conversation with you because now they feel uncomfortable of like, should I ask her for a price or should I wait until she tells me? And if I wait, like, am I going to be embarrassed when I can't afford it? So right. it's been proven to me over and over and over again. I actually had a client one time, her and I used to argue about the, not argue, but she refused to put pricing on her website. Cause she had a business coach that, you know, told her you don't put pricing on your website. And so, you know, she heard my philosophy. She worked with me for a few years and then she finally broke down and put some pricing on her website. I'm not even joking. We were at a, a training that I had a bunch of my clients in. It was a live event I was doing. And one of my clients, we got into this conversation about pricing and websites specifically. And one of my clients came up to me at, during one of the breaks and she said, Nikki, I have to tell you that I have wanted to hire this client of mine who wouldn't put pricing on her website. She's like, I wanted to hire her two years ago, but I didn't think I can afford her because she wouldn't have pricing on her website. And I was too embarrassed to call and ask her. And as soon as she put pricing on our website, I realized I could afford her and I actually hired her. And I was like, okay, so she delayed getting a client for two years because she didn't want to put pricing on her website because somebody out there said it's in your best interest to not put pricing. But here's the thing. You're not selling for your best interest. It should be for your client's best interest. So should you put pricing on your website? Yes, you should. Well, and I love this because I've gone back and forth. Like anybody who's like looked at my website, sometimes there's pricing and sometimes there's not. Right. And it's always because, yes. you know, I, I have a new coach or something. who's like, you should take that. And same thing, like you said, right. Yeah. Like you, then you can have a sales call and I'm like, yeah, but I have yet to not close a sales call. <laughs> if I can get somebody on the phone, I know I'm, I'm really good at it, but I'm the same way. Usually if I go, I know for myself, if I go to a website, if I want to work with somebody, I automatically think in my head, whatever it is that they're selling, if there's no price on it, it's, it's over 10,000 automatically is what registers in my head. Mm -hmm. And that's why yeah. they don't, that's why they're not listing it there, which sometimes might not be the case. So I did, I did, I wrote it to anybody who's watching the video. I wrote it down on a sticky note. I'm like, put the pricing back up on the website if it's not there yet, <laughs> because I think yeah. it's, it's true. And I'm not embarrassed about my pricing. Like it's, no. so I always think of that. Like I'm not, I don't feel ashamed or I don't feel embarrassed to tell somebody how much I charge. So why should I put that on my website? website. Like I would rather somebody be like, okay, how, you know, how can I figure this out? Yeah. Be transparent about pricing. If you act like it's a secret or that it's like, well, I'm just going to make it up in the moment based on what you look like and how much I think you can afford that feels out of integrity. Right. And mm -hmm. so you shouldn't be embarrassed about your price. You should be proud of what you charge. Cause my guess is, you know, that whatever people pay you, the value that they get is probably double, triple that, right? Like they're going to yeah. get huge value when they work with you. So now I will say that there are some people, depending on your business, where it, you just couldn't put a price because there isn't a set price. There's some kind of, but you can put a range. Now, a lot of business coaches or sales coaches or people who call themselves sales coaches will say, we'll just put the starting price. That's a huge mistake because oh, if you like just, just put the, the starting like the price, starting at whatever, yeah, like starting okay. at 700, right? All you did now is you just anchored that lower price. So any price over 700 feels expensive to this other person that's looking. Right. But if like you, you said, range, the, three, the three choices. So they've yeah. grabbed onto that 700. Okay. Yeah, so yep. anything over 700, it's like, man, now she's just gouging me. But if you say it ranges between 700 and 7,000, I don't care what the range is. Now, when you say the package I recommend for you is 5,500, they're like, Okay, I get it. It's, you know, it's with, it. now it doesn't necessarily mean it is in their budget. We don't know that yet. Mm -hmm. They don't know it yet either, but chances are they're at least going to get on a call with you and have a conversation or at least give you a look, a second look. And you've got to capture people's attention again, because there's so much competition out there. It's so easy to get this information from other people. And if you're making it hard, this, the, Every time you make a client jump through a hoop to get something they need from you, they're going to stop. They're not going to do it. Doesn't mean because you're not worth it or because, you know, they don't see the value in you. It's because they're exhausted. We're tired. Our brains are tired. We have so many decisions to make every single day 
Stop taxing your clients, make it easy for them to hire you. And the fact of the matter is, and I feel really passionate about this, the easier you make it for people to work with you, they're going to like, period. You will get more clients when you make it easier for people to have success in hiring you. Yeah. And I think it's like, you know, like you said, I mean, people are inundated with stuff. And I think too often, you know, if someone's sitting on a bench and you have a coffee shop that you make it really hard, like people are like, I'll just wait a Starbucks will open in five minutes. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> Somebody will build another one. Like I just, I, you know, and I think it's true that too often we think in that, you know, that we mistake, uh, complication, um, or, you know, this, this web that we make people go through as creating intrigue, um, not just, it's really annoying. Like, you know, it's annoying on the other end. Like I always try to fill out my own questionnaires and go, was this annoying? Like, did this take me too long? What did this look yes. like? Like, I love because it's, it's, you know, sometimes, you know, or I'll sit there and, and go back to one and be like, oh, send me this. And I, and I'll be like, that's question doesn't make any sense. Like, or I would, I would change this or I would reword it or whatever the case may be. But sometimes we don't, right. Because again, we get stuck in that, you know, we don't think about what that, what it's like for the, the user, Who's actually That's trying right. to be like, oh my God, can you just take my money? Yeah. You know, like, I mean, depending on how you feel about this company, but I happen to be a huge fan of Apple products, <laughs> but Apple makes it so easy for you to buy their product, get their product, get answers to their questions. You get the product, it's delivered. It's beautiful when you open it. Like it's a great buying experience. Your buying experience should be great for your clients too. Yeah. And I'm not saying you have to like, do all the fancy packaging that Apple's doing. I don't even mean that, but you know, like it's pretty easy to get the answers that you need. And it's pretty easy to order product from, from Apple. As a matter of fact, I just ordered something from them the other day and it was delivered two days later. And then they gave me a session to like, walk me through how to, how to use it for free. Right. And it was like, this is amazing. And they, they gave me like an option I could pay in full or I can make it in payments, like so easy. And, mm -hmm. and I'm just using them as an example. I love their products, but whether you like their products or not, it is about making the experience easy for people. And the easier you make it for them to buy, they will, they just will. Yeah. Well, and I think sometimes out of sight, out of mind, like I recently, I think it was like two days ago, got an email from a company that I had ordered slippers on through Amazon. And they just sent me a, like this quick message that was like, Hey, um, hope you are enjoying the slippers that you got from us. We just wanted to kind of give you this coupon. And then they were like, and by the way, did you know? And then it had like four points, but it was like, you can put them in the washing machine. They can go in the dryer. Like, and I was just like, Oh, now in hindsight, I'm like, there probably was a tag on the shoes that said exactly what they're saying to me, but I bought another pair of slippers. <laughs> right. I go. was like, right. And it's that, it's that, you know, it was easy for me. I didn't have to go searching for them. You know, it was, it was enticing without being pushy, but they they were just like, Hey, and we've got these ones that kind of match your style or whatever. And I was like, wrap them up. <laughs> right. Like, exactly. I, I think we're all guilty for that, which is why these large companies do this. I mean, Amazon does it like, Oh, you liked this. You might be interested in these things. And you're like, yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. That's a really great example too, of that, you know, Amazon doesn't assume that you know everything that they sell right. or that you know what are the complementary products. They actually tell you yeah. these are complementary products to what you just ordered. Th like that, that is what you you and your team need to be doing all the time with your clients as well. Because if they don't know that you offer something and then they go buy it from somebody else and you're like, well, why didn't you buy that from me? You work with me. And they're like, I didn't know. <laughs> That's on you. Like right. that's your fault, not theirs. It's your job to educate. It's your job to plant seeds and it's your job to issue invitations for people to take next steps with you. Well, and I think these are important questions to know anyway, because I know a lot of times some of my products have come from people going, you know, oh, I'm like, I'm looking for this and then somebody else is looking for it and then somebody else is looking for it. And I'm like, I'm just going to create this. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Like one yeah. to me, once three people say I'm looking for this and I have the knowledge to do it, I'm like, I really need to be doing that. Why am I not doing that? And sometimes that's how, like, now I don't, I just really, my clients are creating all of my new packages <laughs> for me. 
Same, same. I have a, I have a five, a five time rule in my business. If I teach something five times or break it down for somebody like five different clients, I turn that into content and it becomes either a course, a podcast, a book. It becomes something <laughs> because if I've, if I've showed five people how to do something, there's other people out there that, that will want to know this. Yeah. So put it well, in, and it's yeah, usually those things that it. we think, Oh, this is like super easy. You know, it only takes me a couple of seconds to do. Whereas somebody else is like, no, like decades, <laughs> it would take me decades to figure this <laughs> out <laughs> or to even, even think of it, you know? Yeah. Right. Like to, to have somebody have a solution that's so easy for you, that's going to so save you time probably save you a lot of angst and energy and probably save you money from trying to figure it out on your own. Like I will pay money for that all day long. Yeah. And so, you know, in your business, what are the things that you can offer to your clients that save them time and angst and money in the long run? Like they'll pay you money for those things. So speaking of paying money for things, let's talk a little bit about your books. Cause you have three books that you, you have out there. So, mm -hmm. um, and I'm really interested in the buying sing signals one, but let's, um, which is uh, in my Amazon caught as we speak. Ah, <laughs> so I'll get it out. I promise I'll get it out, but talk to us about the books you wrote. Um, what are they about and, um, who are they for? So my latest book is called The Selling Staircase and it's the five steps for the sales conversation. That is my most comprehensive sales book. Like that really kind of breaks down my whole philosophy on sales, a lot of the, st the stuff that I teach and train on. And actually there's a whole section in there on buying signals as well. So that's the most comprehensive book on sales. Buying signals I wrote because I started talking about buying signals and people were like, what are you talking about? There are signals that people give and what am I supposed to say? So I put it in a really fast, easy read book. I think you can probably read that book and like, depending on how fast of a reader you are, I'm going to say under an hour, like okay. probably like 30 minutes. And it just breaks down the 17 buying signals and what, what to say and how to look out for them and you know, all the, all that stuff. So that was the second book I wrote. The first book I wrote is called Six Word Lessons on Influencing with Grace. And that comes from my background in neurolinguistic programming. It's a hundred little mini lessons on how to be a better communicator. So um, I actually wrote that book right before I launched Sales Maven. So it came out when Sales Maven was started, but I wrote it just as a wanting to offer people some really simple tips on how to be better communicators with the important people in their life. So, um, next I want to talk about your podcast because I was saying off air that you had one episode that I was listening to, which I will have the link. You guys need to go and, and listen to her podcast as well, but you were in it. You were talking about using the word this instead of that. Now I'm not expecting you to give it all away. Cause I really want people to go listen to the episode, but talk to us a little bit about what people can expect to find when they go and listen to your show. So I have a couple different types of episodes that air. I have solo episodes and that's one of the ones you're talking about as yeah. a solo episode where I actually am teaching and breaking down a concept. So I'll break down the concept and then I'll give you, I'll either break down like, this is what not to do. Here's what to do instead. Or I'll show you that, like, I'll give you examples of like what, what you're talking about. Here's what it sounds like when you use the word this in your messaging. This is what it sounds like when you use the word that. And here's why this is better than that in this context. Okay. And then I also have episodes where I do on-air coaching calls with my existing client base. So they come on and ask a question and you get to kind of be the fly on the wall and like, listen to me, coach a client. And then we do sales success stories where clients come on and they share about a technique or a strategy that they've implemented into their business and the results that they've gotten from it. And then I also do mastering excellent series which is where I do a deep dive with a expert on a particular topic and really kind of break down through questions that I'm asking them, their structure of how they're achieving excellence in a particular area of their life or business. So I know there's people that are sitting out there. Oh, I know there's two things. One are wondering what the thing is for this and that. I know it, <laughs> but I will promise I will put the link directly to that episode to listen to because I've started um, going through and looking for that. But 
I know that some are sitting there going, okay, I need, I need more of this. I need help with this. So talk to them a little bit about more ways that they can find you and you know, who your ideal client is that you like to work with. Yeah. So my, thank you. So my ideal client typically is somebody who's been in business for at least a year um, up to about 10 years. And it doesn't really matter whether you're, you haven't hit six figures yet, or if you're a multi seven figure business, if you have a team of people that are interacting with your clientele, I can offer them some training. If you are trying to scale your business and the sales conversation still feels kind of awkward and clunky for you, I can absolutely show you ways to make it smooth, seamless, easy, not just for you, but for the prospect as well, so that you close more business. And I work with clients one-on-one. -on -one. I do some training, some training courses where I come into organizations and train. And then I have a group coaching program where um, people get to come and be on live coaching calls with me in a group setting. They get access to my training center, which has a myriad of sales content. And then they get access to me in a private group where I do, I think I mentioned where I rewrite a lot of their messages for them. I love that. Well, we'll make sure we have all of the links where everybody can find you and you have a free gift for our listeners. Can you talk to me about that sales training? Yes. So this is mastering the sales conversation where I really break down the five steps in detail. And it's a mini training. I think it's less than... I want to say it's less than 15 minutes long. Okay. It's broken into really fast, easy, little like digestible training content that you can immediately implement. And you can get that by going to your salesmaven.com forward slash Fox. So that's for your listeners. I'd happily gift that to them. Oh, well, thank you so much for that. We'll make sure that we list that as well. Thank you so much, Nikki, for coming on, for sharing your stories, but also some great knowledge. I think this is really going to help a lot of our listeners to not feel like this has to be such an icky feeling when you're doing sales. This can be as simple as just having a conversation with somebody. Well, thanks for having me. I really, I really appreciate you. Uh, it was so great to have Nikki as a guest. I got so much out of this episode. You guys all know I am a sucker for puns. I'm a, su a sucker for things that make it easy to remember. So I really love Nikki's this or that. I love her dog calling versus cat calling. Um, I want to know also what it was that you took away from this episode. What was the thing that you were like, oh my gosh, that is a good idea. I do not do that. So I want you to send me a message and let me know or comment below in the post or wherever it is that you're watching this. Let me know what was it that really resonated with you because I want to know and I want to let Nikki know as well. Um, we have some exciting things coming up, some great guests, some new programs, and some really exciting events that we're going to be attending. So make sure that you stay tuned. Make sure that you follow us, hit your notifications. Um, make sure that you're staying tuned because we're going to have very special offers for you guys for everything that we're doing so you can come along on the ride. And remember, no matter what it is that you're doing today, make sure you take time to have fun. Because as I always say, if you're not having fun, why are you doing it?